Hey, are you ready? The Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss. So let's adapt that and just, you know what? This greeting that we just gave to the Lord, let's give to one another and all the people at all the campuses. We're here doing this together. So let's just say welcome in, everybody. We're doing a big thing together today. So I really am, I really am excited uh, because I think we're entering into a season that's going to be highly impactful for what can be for every single one of us and for us together. And it's making me think about the fact that Carl and I have been at Mountain for 25, we're celebrating 25 years this year, and I thought back to the very first sermon that I preached here. I was young, and I did not know a lot, but here's I, the one thing I just thought, I just, I want to go today on my first sermon, I just want to lift up Jesus, like hold him up, I didn't care, I didn't, I couldn't think to the future much, didn't think about buildings, didn't think about, you know, lots of people, we just thought, could we just lift up Jesus, and we did that to see what might happen, and then tried to describe the kind of church that Jesus calls together. Like, what would it look like if the church was working right? And could we do that? And I just preached my guts out and, and just did that. And then at the end said, what do you think? And I gave an invitation for anyone to respond to that. And it was the last thing on my mind that anybody would actually do anything about it. I was just trying to not look like an idiot on my first day as, as the new guy. I'll never forget this guy. His, I learned later his name was Lou. He comes out of his seat and he comes walking down the aisle, kind of a crazy look in his eye coming right at me. Lou was an agnostic or an atheist. He was a scientist. He had a lot of skepticism in his life, a lot of hurt and a lot of stuff going on. And what I didn't know is that God had been kind of nudging Lou and moving him along in his story, you know. And his wife was like, hey, there's a new guy. You're going with me to church. You got to hear him. You're the new guy. And something happened that day where he, he stepped across the line of faith right there before my eyes. He looked at me and he said, I get it. I'm in. It clicked today. I believe this. Jesus is Lord. I'm in. And I was like, yes. We went up into the water right then. You know, put on my waders. We went up into the water, baptized that guy, brought him up out of the water on my first day. And he's like, ha, 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 yes. I'd never seen anything like that. And at that moment, it was like, I honestly had to, it was like a gut check because I realized, oh, my goodness, this, this is all like real. Like, this works. It was a shock, and I watched Lou over the next 25 years turn his life on a completely different trajectory. He's a Christ follower today with an amazing family, and it happened in that moment. And I said deep in my spirit, like that day, I said, God, if you will do this again, I will give everything I am to see this happen, what just happened right now, over and over again. You know what, you guys, over 25 years that I've been here, God has done that thousands of times. Thousands of times, and we've watched, haven't we? God is just, God shows up. This is real. He does, and it's like those few hundred people became several thousand people in four campuses and new churches, other places, and global impact, and these epicenters and all of that, and it's not just 25 years. It's like almost 200 years God has been blessing and doing good, and here's one thing I absolutely know. God isn't done. I'm really confident in, in saying that. God isn't done. God isn't done with his church. I think there's more, and God isn't done with you. So I don't know where you are right now with God, but I know this, God's not done. I know there's more. And that's why today it feels to me like such this big historic moment, you know, this catalytic event that can help us redefine who we are in God and where we're going and we're embarking on the biggest thing. We're just saying, God, we, we're ready to make it the biggest thing we've ever done and the biggest step of faith, the most assertive thing we've ever tried for you, which means we're, we're just launching something that we want to see what God's going to do. And I just honestly hope none of us misses it because you like you check out or you got your arms folded or you just like you miss it somehow. I just hope no one does. We've created a special video to kind of launch this thing. I want to show it to you right now, and I just want to say, God, will you just, if there's hearts that are, if there's any part that's closed, you'd open up everything to what you have for us. Amen. Watch the screen. When you look at the world today, it's pretty easy to get discouraged, isn't it? 
things are just so messed up. It seems like there's so much bad stuff. Addiction and abuse and anger are way up. Hope and happiness are way down. It's like the threads that hold our moral fabric are unraveling. You add in the war, the social unrest, the politics and all the problems and it's just a lot of bad stuff. And the pandemic didn't help. We got disconnected. It wasn't just hard on our bodies, it was hard on our souls. Honestly, I've never seen a time like this. When people were so divided and angry, so full of fear and anxiety. Suicide's like an epidemic. You realize that nearly half of kids today say they have no hope for the future? Half. And this Northeast corridor that we call home, up here in the Northeast with 70 million other people, has the highest percentage of unchurched anywhere in the country. And Hartford County has the highest percentage of unchurched anywhere in the state of Maryland. So we've got so many people, but so few who really know Jesus and the love and the hope that he can bring. So with so many hurting people and so much bad stuff and everything just seeming like a mess, what do you suppose God thinks? I mean, do you think Jesus wants to do anything about the mess? What do you suppose God wants his people to do about the mess? Well, God still loves the world. and He's never been afraid to jump into a mess. That's why 2,000 years ago, God unleashed the most powerful force for good the world has ever seen. Through Jesus, God stepped into the mess in person. And the Bible describes Jesus' life by saying, he went around doing good. People tried to stop him. The powers of evil tried to stop him. Death itself tried to stop him, but Jesus is unstoppable. And today, Jesus is still unstoppable. He said, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. We are God's strategy for doing unstoppable good in the world. And Jesus promises, I will be with you. But now he's calling us and asking who's with me. Who will bring my good in the middle of the mess? That's what God calls us to do. That's what the church is for. And that's why nearly 200 years ago, God gathered this little group of Jesus followers and formed a church. And that church is called Mountain. From our humble beginnings in a log cabin meeting house, to little clapboard church buildings, to stately steepled stone structures and multiple expansions and new campuses along the way. Mountain's always been about doing whatever it takes to do good and make room to welcome more to the amazing things God is doing in this special place. God has worked through us to change thousands of lives by spreading and being God's good news in this community and around the world. But it's not been easy. We've got a real enemy who's working against us. And we face some huge obstacles and hard challenges along the way. But by God's grace, we've kept going and growing through multiple wars, financial depressions, and huge social upheaval, and now two pandemics. For 198 years, God's mission through Mountain has been unstoppable. And that's because at every defining moment along the way, mountain people have shown this gritty determination and radical commitment to a faithful God who has kept making ways where there was no way. And so here we are on a mission field like this, at a time like this, with all this bad stuff and all this need. And yet I can tell you, I've never been more excited about the future than I am right now. 
because I've never seen a time when God's been more powerfully at work in the lives of our people, lighting a fire in our hearts. And you can see it and feel it in the stories of life change all around us. We came to Mountain right after my mom passed. She said, promise me you will find a church home for these children. Before Mountain, I, I loved God. I knew God. I never thought about a relationship with God. I didn't think that would happen. One, because he was not a believer. Um, but we found Mountain. As parents, we want the best for our kids. We're blessed to be in you know, a community of people that supported us all of those years in raising them. I got baptized uh, like three days after I came to Christ. It changed my entire outlook as far as a discipleship journey with that and where I was, because then I had to really take an inward look. As I started learning about relationship with God, I wanted to know Him more. I wanted to be more like Him. And I really found my purpose to be more like Jesus. It's awesome that like we live in our community where we go to church. I feel like that impacts yeah. our marriage. And Mountain changed something for me as far as relationship with God. All of the groups, different ways to get connected, different ways to serve has like fueled our relationship with God. I, I feel like our faith wouldn't be as challenged. Because I, I needed this, I definitely needed this. The friendships, um, and I call a family that we've made at Mountain, at some of the worst times in our lives, the church just stepped in. This is an exciting time for Mountain. New faces and families are joining. Momentum is building. There's a sweet spirit in our midst. So this is a defining moment. This is no time for business as usual, or a time to coast or focus on ourselves or play it safe. It's a time for God's people to rise up and bring God's good to the table. And as leaders, we can sense that God is really up to something. He's calling us to a time of deep spiritual growth and massive mission advancement, which will be the biggest thing we've ever undertaken. And this special two-year, church-wide, everyone-in initiative is called Unstoppable Good. Unstoppable Good is about coming together to make a difference for good. And make no mistake, every single one of us is needed. God is calling you to step forward and make a difference by saying, I'm in it for good. When you look at the needs around us and the way God has blessed Mountain, there is so much important ministry we just have to do. But before we pursue these things that God wants to do through us, it's important that we be ready and open for the things that God wants to do in us, the spiritual growth. Because first and foremost, Unstoppable Good is about spiritual growth, where every single one of us is ready to really engage with God, listening for how He's calling us to, to love and to give and to serve and to pray in new ways. And if we really let God work in us like that, then God will do something amazing through us. I really believe God is going to use this experience to bring us together, to grow our faith and expand our generosity so we can do more good than we've ever done. And when you take all that together, the vision by God's grace and our expanded generosity, it's really exciting. For example, we're going to launch some new mental health initiatives. We all know how many people are hurting, and we're going to change that story. Coming to Mountain, I probably was actively in like I, what I call episode of like a depressive episode where it was affecting my day to day life. And I was able to start being honest and, you know, knowing that I wasn't alone and how I was feeling like I'm going to be OK. We're going to multiply our efforts with young adults. We love college age and 20 somethings, but many of them are struggling. And they need a safe place to get answers, make friends, find community and their purpose and know Jesus. And we're excited that through a new staff role and a team of people investing in young adults, we'll be unstoppable. 
And we're going to beef up our sports ministry by hiring a full-time position and developing some dormant fields so we can reach more people through sports and activity. We're praying God will grow our church by 2x, doubling the, the number of guests and baptisms and people at each campus. We're going to expand our focus on kids and students. So we all know how much kids have been through in recent times, and we're going to double down on our ministry to kids. We're going to prepare to launch Mountain's next campus. This model works, and God, he's going to show us when and where to launch our next campus. And when he does, we want to be ready. We're going to expand our epicenter by expanding into the 14,000 unoccupied square foot space at our Edgewood campus, we're able to bring in under our one roof, the Tabitha's House, Extreme Family Outreach, and Choose Hope Women's Center. More space and more partners equals more impact. We're gonna build a new camp for high schoolers in Kenya with Missions of Hope. With the success of the sixth grade camp and all the exciting things that are happening there, we are also looking forward to having another camp for grade 10. And uh, we are so, so thankful that uh, Mountain Christian Church has gotten the vision to work together with us to have that camp. In addition to projects like these, we're going to increase our digital ministry impact. We're going to introduce a new Mountain app. We're, we're going to improve some physical ministry spaces at some of our campuses. We're going to reduce debt and plant new campuses. And all of that, in addition, to the beautiful things Mountain is already doing. Now listen, Mountain has had an incredible history of nearly 200 years, but I really believe the best is yet to come. Like nothing in our past compares with our future. And the Mountain people who've come before us, they have walked faithfully and God's done some amazing things. Now it's our time. It's our time to step up and step forward. So what about you? What about you? I mean, I hope you feel that God is really calling you to do something important and significant with your life that truly matters. And we can do that together. But only when you say, I'm in it for good. I'm in it for good. I'm all in. And I hope you are too. Let's go. So I, I mean, I, I just, to me, I can just sense, I can just feel that what, what we do together over the next six weeks is going to be so important and impactful to our lives and to our church. I think it's going to have a tremendous imprint on what happens over the next two years. And what happens over the next two years is going to have a tremendous impact on what happens over the next decade. So I feel like there's just so much that's right here in front of us. Uh, right now, and, and I'm excited about it. Of course, it all comes back to that word good. You like that word good? Oh, great. You sound really pumped about it. <laughs> yeah, good. You know, God created everything, right? And he put some of himself in everything, and he said, he stepped back, and he said, hey, that's really, good. yeah. Of course, then we got a hold of it, and it became ungood in a hurry. But God said, I'm not going to leave it. I'm going to put this rescue and restoration project together. And that's what the whole story of the Bible is about, is God saying, I'm going to bring everything back the way I want it to be. And that's when he sent the most powerful force for good ever, which was Jesus. I love how Acts 10, 38 summarizes everything Jesus did. Think of all the ministry he did, the healing, the loving, the teaching, the truth, all of it. Acts 10, 38 says, yeah, uh, Jesus, uh, he went around doing good. That's, that's just it. That's just, Jesus went around doing good. And of course, then he says, now you are my body, and my strategy for doing good in the world is us, y'all. And he promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It's unstoppable good. And so here we are at such a time as this. And I love the fact that I love the fact that, you know, there's so much evil and dark and all this stuff that's got everybody worked up in the world today. And you know what the Bible says? It says the main job you have is not to wring your hands about it or get mad about it or attack it or get angry with it. You know what it says? Romans 12, 21 says, don't be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil with what? Yeah. And that's what we're going to do. So I just really believe 
in all my heart that there's some tremendous things that God is going to be able to do through us, okay? You heard some of that. But I, I hope you hear me now. Like, the only way that's going to happen, that God will be able to do what he wants to do through us, is if we say yes to what God wants to do in us. Does that make sense to you? You hear what I'm saying? Like, this whole thing is about our ability to step toward God and say, I'm yours. I'm really here. I'm your person. I want, I want to grow spiritually. I'm ready to go where you want me to go with, with my life. And I so that's what I hope today is for for you, is that you would begin a prayerful journey of being able to get to the place where you could say those, those words in that byline, like, I'm in it for good. Like, that's a statement of declaration. It's like, I'm not going to wiggle or waffle or run away. I'm like, I'm in it. I'm in it for good. That's a statement of faith, and that's, that's where, where we want to be. Now, we've got some friends, I think, that are going to hand out a guidebook for you right now. So it looks like this. And so if you'll just kind of quickly take your place, friends, and get those booklets passed out. Everyone's going to get one. It's not one per family, or every single person can get one. You know, one of the first things you should do, honestly, is when you get this little guidebook, is write your name in the front, because they look. a lot of them look very similar, Okay. In fact, they're identical. So write your name. And the reason is, I, I really hope you keep this with you, and it's kind of a guide for the journey that God might want to take you on. And uh, it'll remind you how personal it really is. Now, in here, um, let me just remind you also, if you're joining us online or whatever, um, everything in this booklet is available digitally. Here's a website that we've created. It's like a micro website, and it's called unstoppablegood.church. And uh, I'll put that on the screen so you can see it right there, and that's where you will go to find everything if you're online or you need all this stuff digitally. Can I, while those are getting passed out, everyone's going to get one today. Uh, let me just tell you about four things that you're going to find in that booklet, okay? First, you're going to find a vision recap. I know we covered a lot of stuff in the video, but it went really fast, so here's your chance to go back over it and look more closely at some of the vision recap. It will remind you of what our primary and secondary goal is. Y'all know what the primary goal of Unstoppable Good is? The primary goal, listen to me now, is that 100% of us, like everyone here, would really enter into a kind of unprecedented season of spiritual growth where we're really engaging with God in a kind of discipleship and growth and generosity that we've maybe never seen before in our lives. Okay, that's the primary goal, is that we would really engage with God like that. The secondary goal is that there's all kinds of stuff that God's going to do through us. New ministry that we're going to impact, and this expanded generosity is going to allow us to take some big steps forward over the next two years so that we can stretch and strengthen and spread God's good to more people. So that, that's, that's the idea. And the vision will just help you recapture that. So it, I know it went by fast, but it'll give you a chance to kind of get excited about the fact we're going to launch some mental health initiatives. And we're going to do some important new work with young adults. And we're going to double down on what we're doing for kids and students. That's all part of the vision. It's going to talk about this sports ministry that needs to happen here that's not yet happening. And the new camp in Kenya and the expanded epicenter and the new app and some of the digital ministry enhancements that we can make and the new churches we'll plant and the new investment in leadership pipeline and the repairing of some facilities, the reduction of debt, some explosions of good that are going to bless people, and the preparation to launch our next campus. All that's part of the vision. Now, let me remind you um, what we already know. God's already doing a lot of really cool things through Mountain. We, we get that. There's so much that's happening already. And, you know, sometimes people get confused about, well, what is this? What's unstoppable good is, is all of what's already happening. It's all celebrated and included in Unstoppable Good, but it's plus. It's like, let's go beyond status quo. Let's go beyond just business as usual. Let's take a step forward and do some new ministry that God is calling us to do, and all of it comes out of one church, one group of people. There's not a separate fund. There's not a separate thing. It's like all of it that we do, what we've been doing and what we're going to do next 
is all unstoppable good. So hopefully that makes some sense to you. So that's the first thing in the booklet is kind of that vision recap. The second thing you'll see in there is a place for some message notes. Because our hope is that, you know, you'll bring this back every week and, and you'll engage in maybe the things that God impresses on you to remember or to think about further. You'll, you'll write in there so that it, it represents some of your journey, okay? Third, you're going to find some small group content. Remember, our goal is 100% engagement. So that means, man, don't try to do this solo. Like, get here on the weekend, but engage with a group. It's going to change so much about how you feel about your life of faith. So the train's about to leave the station. It's not too late. You can still get on board. We'll help you find a group that meets whether on campus or a certain night of the week or morning or in a home or whatever. We'll help you. And students, this is also your group's guide as well. Okay? And fourth... Um, included with this book is a commitment card. And our hope is that you would look at this, com this commitment card as a kind of like sacred tool that God will use to call you to the greatest step of faith you've maybe ever made, to take you to a new place that you've not yet been. And there's a time coming for this, and I just invite you to put that in a place that's kind of special that you'll see it, your kitchen table or a nightstand or something, so that every time you see it, it'll just kind of remind you to be praying about, God, what are you saying to me, and what are you asking of me, so that you can get ready to put your yes on the table like Lou did and move forward when it's time, okay? A couple more things. There's some awesome stuff for kids that we've planned and, and written and prepared. So if you have kids, you need to stop by Mountain Kids today and, and be sure to get the family devotional that we've put together. And uh, you can also get that on the website for downloadable digital stuff, all right? But there's a bunch of stuff for kids. And then finally, we just really want this to be like a, a spiritual journey that we all take together. So it seems like what if we just kind of all committed to saying, I'm going to spend some intentional time with God every day over the next six weeks just to hear from God and just spend time in his presence. And to help that happen, um, we've created what we're calling like your daily dose of good, all right? So put this thing on the screen here. If you just text the word good right now, you can do it right now, to that number, 833-269-9787. You text the word good. What's, what we're going to do is we're going to send you every day a short video that we've prepared, and it will work through some scripture, like a, a little bit of the book of Psalms, and then like a challenging thought and a devotional thought and a prayer to kind of just get all of our minds centered on the Lord as we start our day. It'll start on Monday morning, tomorrow, and, uh, and we can kind of go from there. So I hope you'll, you'll do that. We'll leave that up there for a little bit. Right now... What I'd like you to do is open your booklet to page 23, where you have a space to kind of take some notes, and let's dive in today, because every week what we want to do is we want to say, how can we take a step to get to where we're like 100% saying, Lord, here I am, okay? That's what this is about. Like, that's what spiritual faith looks like, is when, so how can we take that step even beginning today. It reminds me of a verse out of, a, of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this. Let's read, look at it. It says, without what? Without faith, it is what? Does it say it's not easy to please God without faith? Does it say it's not advisable to try to please God without faith? Does it, say, it, it, it says it's actually impossible because what God looks for and longs for is that element of faith. And so that's where we're trying to create some space. Okay, God, help me with that kind of faith. And there's probably no better example in the Bible than the Old Testament dude, Ab Abraham. Okay? Abraham. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to learn some things about his life that will help us in ours. One of the things you need to know about Abraham is when we meet him here, He's had a lot of dreams for his life, and it looks like none of them are coming true. He's 75 years old, and it looks like all of his progress has stopped. Abraham has achieved some success, what the world would deem success. He's got property and lands and animals and all that, but he's still hungry and missing significance. How many of you know the difference? Maybe, you, maybe you're a person 
who has tasted some success, what the world would consider success, but you're still like, I would love more significance. That's Abraham. And here's something interesting about him. It's kind of sadly ironic about his life. His name is Abram. Okay, God later changes his name to Abraham. All right? Here's the sad irony. His name Abram literally means father. And Abraham, where his name would be changed, means father of many. So here's this guy. Abram means daddy, and Abraham means big daddy. And, and yet he doesn't have any kids. And he's 75 years old, and he's living with his wife, Sarah, in this place that's modern-day Iraq. And it's like life is a cruel joke, like some of us. It's like, I want to do some good. I want to make a difference. It just seems like life's passed me by. And God says, I've got some ideas here. And that's right where we are exactly right now. Now, before we move on here, I want you to know one other thing. If you scroll back one chapter in your Bible from Genesis 12, where we meet Abraham, go back to Genesis 11, and you've got to feel what's going on here. Chapter 11 tells about the people building something called the Tower of, who knows what? The Tower of Babel. It was like humanity's project to show that we were rejecting God. That's what the Tower of Babel was. It was like our way of saying, we don't need you, God. We've got other things to do. We don't really want you in our life. In other words, it was a very spiritually dark time. There was only one family that still belonged to the Lord in those days. And they pretty much all get sucked in and consumed by the world around them, go after other idols. And there's only one guy left, Terah, and his family. He's only got one son. His name is Abram, and he doesn't have any kids. So you see this whole spiritual dark time. It's like a candle of faith is about to be snuffed out. And God's whole plan of redemption and good is about to stop. There's only one guy left, and he doesn't have any kids. In other words, it's it's a time that feels... Maybe a lot like our time does. And God, who is unstoppable, does what he always does. And that is, he calls a person to take a step of faith and to trust him to get good going in the world. That's how God always works. And that's what happens here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, go. Y'all, God speaks, and he still speaks, just like he did to Abraham. And often when he does, the first thing he says is, you got to go someplace you've not been. He says, go. Go from your country, your people, and all your father's household to a land. Where am I going, Lord? I will show you. I will show you. Can you imagine that conversation with Abraham and his wife? Hey, uh, honey. Uh, Thanks for dinner. By the way, uh, uh, why don't you pack everything we own? We're leaving tomorrow. It's like, what? Yeah, pack it all. We're leaving. Where are we going? I don't know. Well, how long will we be gone? I don't know. You want me to leave my sister, my my quilting group, everything? You leave it all? Yeah. What? Why? Uh, God told me. Abram, have you been drinking? I mean... How does that conversation go? This might be the only time in recorded history where you've you've got a woman saying, do you really know where you're going? And the husband, instead of faking it, like, oh, totally. He says, I actually have no idea. Only God knows. (laughs) And God only knows where he wants to take you. But I know this. It starts the same exact way with you and me as it did with Abraham. And that is God's going to speak. He's going to call you. And it's going to be you got to go and move someplace you've not been. And it's going to start with a step of faith, because that's how we please God. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Here's what God says to Abram. Here's what it looks like. I'm going to make you into a great nation, you without any kids, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Abram. My goodness. You see how that works? What's the word that keeps popping up there? Bless, blessing. God says, I'm going to do good in the world. Here's how it works. I start by blessing you, and then I want you to bless others, and eventually it's going to go through your descendants until all peoples of the earth are going to be blessed. That's what God wants. This is 
for everyone. And that's what we say that around here because God is willing that none would be perished and left out. God wants to say that everyone can, as the Psalms say, taste and see that the Lord is. Everyone gets in on that. This is for everyone. Friends, listen. There's a lot of people today don't think that's what the church is about at all. They think it's a very exclusive, narrow, mean club of a bunch of people who care only about themselves. It's a bunch of people who think the church is just a bunch of, you know, bigots or whatever. And what they need to see is the goodness of God flowing through a people that are really communicating the way Jesus did that this is for everyone. You see? And we gotta, we've got to keep dreaming about that and aching about that and doing everything we can to make it possible. Do you agree with me? We, we've got to dream of a church that will actually reach across barriers to find people who are far from God and say, you know what, you may hate church, but this is a church for you. Your friends and your family who are facing a Christless eternity need a church like that. We need to keep dreaming of a church where broken people and traumatized people can, can come and be, find out it's okay to not be okay and that they can find healing and hope in Jesus. We need to, to have a church where skeptics and agnostics and atheists can come and find out that God isn't the jerk or the invisible being that they think he is and that he actually loves them. We need to find a church, we need to be a church that's not a holding tank for the righteous do-gooders, but, but a, a hospital for sinners and wounded people, that for alcoholics and addicts and those who are confused and wounded sexually, and all, all the people who've been subject to violence and abuse, and all those people, so that we can find a new path toward a good life that happens through Christ. We need to dream of a church where young adults... And young people who are given up on hope or wrestling with depression can discover that God has good plans for them. We, we, we need to dream of a church where people can have an end to loneliness in a time like ours and can find genuine friendship and community and belonging where Christ is like there and there's real deep friendships. A church that cares for the poor and the disenfranchised and the people kicked to the curb of life, people who are forgotten in nursing homes and in prisons and to the ends of the earth, the traffic, the foster kids, so we can be the hands of Jesus and make a difference and have global impact beyond our little American thought. But we care about people in, in Florida and in Kenya, we need to have a church that we keep dreaming of that breaks down walls that keep dividing everybody. And we live in a world that says you got to go into your camp by your political ideology or your thought life. You know what? But we got to find one place where it's, you know what? Whatever is supposed to drive us apart is not as strong as the Jesus who brings us together because he died on the cross for everyone. So that's what we got to be. That's what unstoppable good is about. And it's a crazy dream. And most people think it's impossible. But I just happen to believe there's a bunch of crazy nut jobs in this church who think it's possible, and we're going to keep going, and that's what unstoppable good is, okay? So that's what you mean when you say, I'm in it for good. You're believing that God wants to, to bless through a person and then another person and a whole bunch of us to the place where all peoples of the earth will be able to taste and see that God is good. Now, that all starts with a bold step of faith on your part and mine just like it did for Abraham. So I want to just leave you with two questions today. Two questions that might be the most important questions we wrestle with this year. So let me, let me give them to you one at a time, and we'll think about them together. The first question is this. Am I truly following God? Like, are you really following God? This is a question about who's in charge of your life. You? You? Or God? It's a tough question, isn't it? Because I think there are times in my life where I want God to be an influence in my life. I welcome him to the table of discussion, but at the end, I'm the CEO and I make the final call. And I, I don't know if I can really say I'm following God. I'm kind of like, God, let's go together and if, you know, you might need to follow me. But God is asking all of us to put our yes on the table here. And we want to say, well, where? How long? What's it going to be like? How is it going to cost? What's the risk-reward? And he's like, mm, da, 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 da. I'll show you. First, I got to know, are you in? There's a trust thing. That's what faith looks like. I love what John Calvin, the great theologian, had to say about this passage. He said, when God called Abraham, what he was really saying to Abraham is just close your eyes and take my hand. 
Close your eyes. You don't get to see everything about where we're going yet. You don't get to see all the details and how it all plays out and every I dotted and every T crossed. You don't get to know that. What I got to know is do you trust me to close your eyes and take my hand? And I will show you. So how about you? Are you at a place? Are you sensing that maybe God has brought you to this moment where you're like, you know what? I'm ready for that step. I've got to trust God. I'm going to take his hand even if I can't see everything. Well, where are we going? How long is it going to be? What's it going to cost me? What about my family? What about my job? What is it, am I going to, you know, it's like, da, 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 da. what's the risk? What's the reward? It's like, yeah, I'm just going to close my eyes and take God's hand and trust him. You know, I learned something in prepping for this that I hadn't noticed before in this passage. And that's that in the previous chapter, chapter 11, the same place where we hear about the Tower of Babel, Abram's whole family uh, was leaving. They were, they were trying to go where God wanted them to go, to, Can to Canaan, the, the promised land. God had told them to go there, and they were there under the leadership of Abram's father. And they were on their way there. They had begun, but, but they stopped halfway. Look at, look at chapter 11, verse 31. Together they set out from Ur, the Chaldeans, to go to Canaan. They were trying to do what God had called them to do. But when they came to Haran, for whatever reason, it looked good or it was a nice place, and they just stopped. And they, what's the word? Man, they settled. I just wonder if there's anybody listening to me right now that can identify with this, like you've settled a little bit in your life with God. You've like drawn a line in the sand. You've said, God, I'm going to give you this much, but that's it. I'm not going to go any further. You started out, but you got somehow kind of maybe stuck or stalled along the way. It happens to all of us. And I think the call here is to say, please don't settle because there's more. And God's moving us to a place we've not been. But God, I see this. My parents never did that. It's like it's not about them. Or I see other people around me. I don't look like they're going all in with you. It's not about them. The question is, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your life of faith before God? Are you really following God. I don't think God's looking for casual Christians. I don't think he's looking for weekend warriors. I think he's looking for people who will take a bold step of faith like Abraham did and trust him and say, I'm in it for good. That kind of commitment is what changes us and it's what changes the world. Half-baked, kind of just kind of doing it as we've been doing it isn't going to cut it. You know, a century ago, there were some brave souls that were called one-way missionaries. Why did they call them that? Well, because these are folks that felt called by God to go to the mission field, but they just bought a one-way ticket. And when they packed up, they didn't pack a suitcase. They put everything, all their earthly belongings in a, in a coffin, and they went. And when they waved goodbye to their friends and family, they knew they were never coming back. A.W. Milne was one of those. And he went with a coffin packed to a place in the South Pacific that he felt God was calling him to, and knowing full well that every single missionary who'd ever gone there before him had been beheaded, beheaded by that headhunter tribe down there. But he, didn't, he had already given his life to Jesus. He had no fear. He had already given his life away. And so he went with a packed coffin. And for 35 years, he lived among that tribe, and he just did good and brought Jesus to them. And when he died, they buried him those tribal people who were now his brothers and sisters in Christ. In the middle of that village, in the coffin that he came with, with a word on his tombstone, when he came, there was no light, and when he left, there was no darkness. Folks, I don't know when we started thinking that following Jesus was just supposed to be some casual commitment that was just comfortable for us and never cost us anything or never cramp our style. I don't think Jesus died just mainly to make us safe and comfortable. He died to overcome evil with good. And now he's doing the same thing he did with Abraham. He's trying to work through people who will say, I'm in it for good. And I know it's going to take some faith on my part to trust a God that's bigger than me. So if something happens with my life that wouldn't happen if I were in charge. And that's what this whole doggone thing is about. And it starts with you and me saying, I'm in. I trust God enough to see where he might take me with my time, with my talent, with my treasures. So it's a big, bold thing, isn't it? It's exciting and scary all at the same time. If I can be super frank with you, 
because it's important. I hear people all the time say, man, I just love this church. I love Mountain. I love what they're doing over there. I love what happens around there, and they're excited and love the mission. And I, I'm glad you're excited. I truly am. But it's possible to kind of say all that from a kind of sitting on the sidelines perspective, more like a fan than a competitor on the field, you know? Like, oh, I love what's happening with the compassion and what's happening with the kids and the missions and all oh, the local stuff and the, all that's really, really great and exciting and the mental health stuff is good and the homeless and all that. But I, honestly, I just don't know. I don't know that God rewards people for being excited about what he's doing. I don't know if he rewards people for being you know, plotting it or being associated with it, but because I know that the deepest and truest rewards are for those who engage and do something about it and who go all in. So I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there that maybe some of us have kind of gotten part way and we stopped in Haran. And I'm just saying, don't settle because there's more. Abraham was there. It's exactly where he was. He'd settled. But look at verse 4. It says, Abraham went. God said, go to a new place, and Abraham went and did what God had told him. And he had plenty of excuses. The guy's 75 years old. He's got more excuses than you and I got. And yet he went, and he did what the Lord had told him. And that's really all we're asking is that what would happen around here is if every one of us just listened to God and did what he told us. Oh, my goodness. So what if we just took God's hand, see where he took us? And asked, I really am following you, God. Second question. What good blessings am I holding on to so tightly that it's actually preventing what the good work that God wants to do in me? You think about that? Like, what good blessing are you holding on to so tightly? It's like stopping what God would really want to do through your life. Like, okay, so Abraham was blessed, right? God blessed him. You think about why? Why did God bless Abraham? To be a blessing, right? That's the whole point. Abraham, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. And God has blessed you and me for the same reason. And we, we've got to ask that question, guys. Well, look at our church. Our church is so blessed. And we've got to ask, well, what does God intend for us to do with that blessing? I mean, what's the purpose of that? Why has he blessed us? Is it just so we could have it and hold it and hoard it? And we've got to ask that question about our own lives. Like, God's blessed you too, and what's the reason for that? What does God intend for you to do with the blessings and the good he has given you? Those are important questions. So what good things... What blessing are you maybe latching onto so tightly that it's preventing you from really appreciating the giver of those and you're holding on so tightly it's actually, you think, because it's a good thing and I've got it and it's good and I like it, but you, with, by holding on so tightly you're actually preventing what God might do in you and through you if you were a little more loose with some of the blessings he's given you. You see how that works? And for you it might be stuff or possessions or, or investments, or, or it could be a relationship, or a marriage, or a kid, or a grandkid, or a hobby, or a career. Whatever we have that's a blessing from God is meant to be, yes, enjoy it, but not hold to it in such a way that it doesn't flow through us to bless others. And when it does, that's when we grow. And if you're holding them so tightly, you'll prevent God from doing that in you. So what is it for you? That you've kind of thought, well, maybe God just did this for my sake. And you're ready to say, I'm ready to be a blessing as a result. And I know some of you are like, well, hold on there, Ben. Wait a minute. I get how we need to do this with our time and our talent. But when it comes to the treasure part, man, I'm not really blessed financially. You know, I, I, in fact, I'm struggling. I'm living close to the wire. And it's like, well, of course, some of us are. We're right, you know, this is a tricky time for a lot of us right now. But don't let that help have you missed the main point God, God isn't after your money God doesn't ever ask you to give something you don't have he knows all of that but at the same time God can't use what you don't share with him everything you have belongs to God right so we're just the managers of those blessings so no matter who you are God's put blessings into your life he's put some good stuff there and what he intends is for you to entrust that for God's good like that woman Jesus saw one day, she didn't have anything, just reached in her pocket, she had like two pennies, and she put it in the, 
they said, this is my gift to you, God. Use it to bless others. And Jesus said, yeah, be like that woman. It's not about the amount. It's about like our hearts with God. So what are you holding on to so tightly? It might be preventing God from working in you. I just, I want to invite you to let God speak to you through this journey. And over the next few weeks, to go, go on a journey, like Abraham did, go on a journey of faith where you trust God where you take his hand, and just as you open your hand so whatever God's put in there, just you see how God might bless you beyond your wildest dreams and see what good he could do through us. And if you're a guest today, I'm so glad you're here because what you're seeing is kind of who we are at our core, like what we care about and our passion, and I'm glad you're here. I also I want to talk to those of you who have any kind of connection to Mountain beyond that of a first-time guest. I want to talk really frankly with you. You might be new here, kind of, or an old timer, whatever. I just, I want to talk about one of the elephants in the room because I realize some of you maybe have never taken the step to fully trust God with every part of your life. And this is your moment. Like, this is your opportunity. Like, you've gone part way, but you've drawn that line and said, I'm not going to go any further. And I just want to encourage you go all in for God and trust Him in every area of your life including your finances, because that's often where it gets real for us. Like, do we really trust God? Like, you say, yeah, but Ben, in the, oh gosh, I'm looking at the economy, and I don't know, it's tricky right now. It's like, I think God's like, exactly. Perfect timing. So I'm going to challenge you to take your first step of faith to trust God in every area, including your generosity in this season, and you just see if he won't open the windows of heaven and bless you beyond what you could imagine. And I want to say something to some others who are maybe more like Carla and me, where we are right now. I mean, we've been giving for years, but in honesty, it kind of gets to be comfortable after a while. It doesn't feel like our fresh, first, best gift. Auto-draft kind of becomes autopilot. And there's a complacency that can settle in. And some of us can be there, like, oh, I already get this, you know? I've already, I've already kind of been there, done that. But we never say that about like, oh, God, you know, I don't need to learn any more about prayer. I'm already, I, I get it. I'm good there. You know, or, or I don't need to learn any more about loving people. I already love perfectly. I don't need to learn any more about forgiveness because I already forgive perfectly. I don't need to learn any more about really caring for people far from God because I'm already perfect in all that outreach stuff. So, you know, we don't say that. And I think it would be a mistake to say, I've already got this whole giving my life, time, talent, treasure to the Lord. I've got it down. It's like, I hope you don't get stuck and settle. And, and I just encourage you, I encourage you to, to do what Abraham did and move someplace new that you've not been. And uh, I hope you'll have the faith and the humility and the spiritual hunger to open yourself to God and say, I'm not really there yet, I know it, and, and I want you to, to help me with this. So, so I'm all in, I hope you are too. So uh, let me just wrap this up, guys. This is an all play, okay? This whole thing is an all play. Like when you play Pictionary, you get the card. It's like, oh, is it just me on this one or is it everybody? And you get the little triangle and it says what? It's an all play. Everybody always asks, is it an all play? Is it an all play? It's an all play. This is an all play. This is, I just don't care if you're 14 or 70 or somewhere in between 44. I just know God's calling you to be in it for good for this period of spiritual growth and mission advancement at Mountain. So can I boldly ask you a few things? One, can I boldly ask you, number one, to be here every week? Okay, you got that big trip planned? Cancel it. No, I'm just kidding. I just, you know what I mean? No, I mean, like, this is important. Like, let's do this together. Like, make every effort you can to be here together. If you have to miss, you know, just catch it online. Get, get caught up. This is important stuff we're going to do. It's going to be a really important adventure. It could change our lives. Second, Bring your guidebook every week with you, okay? Try to remember to bring that. Let's just, it'll be a way to kind of draw us together and keep some notes in there and maybe just the one thing you need to write down each week or whatever. Third, engage in a group. Some of you are still on the bubble with that. Can I just, man, take the plunge. We'll help you and you will be so glad. You'll meet some people and it'll make it more real for you. And number four, do the daily dose of goodness. We'll put that number back on the screen if you didn't get it into your phone or take a picture of it and do it later or whatever. But do the, you know, just, just spend time every day together with the Lord. And then keep that commitment card someplace where it can just be a little prompt, a little reminder, okay, I'm on a journey here and I'm praying and just kind of keep that alive prayer over a six-week period and God will speak into that and do something with it. 
You know, Abraham, Abraham got a call to leave what was comfortable for him, which required him to trust God, and he was a tremendous blessing, wasn't he? And when you think about it, that's exactly what happened with Jesus. You know, he, he got the call, if you will, to leave what was comfortable with the Father and to trust Father, you're not my will but yours. And God has blessed you and me through that with eternal life. And when you think about that, and you know that Jesus left and gave up everything to give us everything, it makes it easier for me to think about, okay, God, what are you calling me to leave and trust you so that I can be a blessing? This makes it easier. And I want to encourage you to get in that space and just listen to the Lord and trust him. He's good. He's not going to lead you astray. I'm in. I hope you're in too. Let's begin a journey today, okay, guys? Let's pray. God, we thank you for calling us to something big, not small, hard, not easy, because we want to change the world. We want to have our lives changed. We don't want to just coast through casual, flippant, nothing really happens around here kind of living. It's scary for us, and so we just pray, will you hold us as we put our hand in your hand? And just help us take those little baby steps of faith that say, oh, I'm willing to try, Lord. And here, we've got an opportunity before us, and I pray that you'll help us to do that. Help us to put our hand in your hand and see where this might lead so that we might do some good to overcome evil with it. We pray all this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.